For our scripture today, uh, we're reading Matthew 21, 1 through 17, and I'll be reading from the New International Version. Matthew 21, 1 through 17. <clears throat> As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the area, Hosanna, son of David, they were, writing, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never heard from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise? And he left them and went out to the city of Bethany where he spent the night. What a marvelous message as we think about the beginning of this week of passion. And interestingly enough, our scripture reading from Matthew's gospel is a scripture that all four of the gospel writers uh, include in their uh, sharing of the gospel story. Not every account is paralleled like that, but in Mark 11 and in Luke 17 and John 12, we have parallel accounts to what we discover here in Matthew 21. And it focuses our attention in a special kind of way. We've read the account and we know this story. The children know this story so well as they demonstrated for us uh, with Linda. Um, and I, I'm sure all of us are familiar with this uh, day by day uh, understanding of this week of the Passion. Most of the gospel stories focus our attention on the events of this week. And so we find ourselves here in this place. I want to suggest this morning, as we think about the deep, deep love of God for us, and how the passion of God for his people is demonstrated in Jesus Christ, that on this day, when we celebrate the triumphal entry, for one brief moment in time, uh, there is a picture of beauty in the temple. In this moment, we find the temple made beautiful. Now, it's interesting to me that it's recorded for us in Mark or in Matthew's gospel, but in none of the other gospels. For instance, you'll find all of this except verse 14 in the other writers where after Jesus says, it's written in my house, it shall be called a house of prayer, of prayer for all nations, and then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he cured them. I'm going to suggest this morning that Jesus made a unique declaration on this day, a unique declaration that comes to us, and it's important for us to think about it, because it turns the whole world upside down. It turns the way that we think about things 
upside down. Now, we might ask the question, we can't every day turn things upside down, or can we? We want to have some kind of expectation of security and comfort. Uh, We come to this place week after week because we uh, gain a measure of security and comfort. We expect that we'll know what's going to happen in the order of service. As a preacher, uh, I've outlined uh, a series of messages. I I, I want to uh, have some order to what we're doing. I don't expect that every day... I can come here and things be turned upside down. So this is a huge question that we need to ask ourselves. You know that we're in this series uh, on Begin Anew, and uh, we began at the beginning of the year, and we're continuing along in it, and we're in that section, Belonging uh, in Community. I mentioned to you last week, you can follow in the book, the materials, uh, and there on pages uh, 32 and 33, uh, we have descriptions of what the church is, and we talked about these last week, except I said the fourth description of the five, an upside-down kingdom, is what the community is about, uh, was going to reserve for today, because Jesus demonstrates something about the upside-down nature of his ministry in the world, and maybe that will speak to us. Maybe Maybe we should come in every week and expect to be surprised by something that has been turned upside down. I'm sure if you came in here and we had turned the benches all around and we were facing the other way, somebody would be surprised. Of course. How much of that can we take? And so that's, that's one of the questions that we, we certainly want to look at. I, I, I told you when uh, um, I gave out the, the brochure at the beginning of the year that uh, details the sermon series, the uh, focus of our year, the beloved community, that there are some spaces left in it. It, it, won't, it, won't, happen that, it won't happen as it's all laid out from uh, January 1. There'll be some surprises along the way. And so uh, rather, than, rather, than, rather than upsetting everything, I kind of built in some spaces, empty places, so that if something comes along, we can make an adjustment. And that kind of defeats the purpose of catching people by surprise and turning things upside down. And so maybe you want to fire me. I don't know. Do you like things turned upside down? Hmm. It's a great question. But Jesus demonstrates somehow in our text today something about the kingdom of God. And by its nature, it turns things upside down. Now, that may be necessary. It may be necessary because we get comfortable in the way that we do things and we need to have that turned around. I want to suggest today that Jesus is the kind of person who can cast things out on the one hand and yet he can take things in. It it almost seems contradictory, but he can cast things out and take things in. Like this text that tells us that he turned the money changers, their tables upside down. He drove the buyer and sellers out of the temple. He really messed things up. But in the next moment, the blind and the lame were there. And he healed them. Casts out, but he draws in. I want to suggest to you that Jesus is the kind of person who can overthrow things. And yet, he can build things up. He challenges the religious leaders. In our text, we read how the authorities were upset with him. Look at this mess that you've made. Listen to these children. They were were upset by the children's voices in the Temple Mount. Jesus has a way of overthrowing things, and yet it seems to me by demonstrating that Jesus welcomes the children, that he's building something up. My guess is, is that Jesus made a hit with every parent that there is. Don't we love it when people recognize our children? Don't we love it when people affirm our children, give space to our children? But that's something about the nature of God's kingdom, and we want to keep that focused in our minds today as well. Jesus has a way of breaking the walls, and yet he can restore or build up our sense of security. Now, there are some people that, want to, that, that think that uh, you can build a wall and make things secure. 
And we, we hear that. But Jesus challenges that way of thinking and saying, if your security is in something that you can do, like building a wall, your security is probably pretty shallow. Jesus offers us a different kind of security. And we see it kind of demonstrated uh, in this text today. I want to look a little more closely at that. What is actually going on here? We, we know that Jesus really made a commotion. He came into this place. But what was this place? You see, Jesus was pointing out that there was something out of order here that needed to be addressed. Many of us have grown up in Sunday school, have gone to vacation Bible school, we've studied uh, some of these things. We know know some things about the Temple Mount. We know that uh, this, this was a temple that had been destroyed and recreated and recreated again a number of times it's, it's been worked on. It was uh, destroyed early on. Nehemiah and Ezra, they come back from exile. They rebuild the temple area, try to build it up. Herod is rebuilding the temple in the time of Jesus. And we know some of the backstory of this, that this was an important place for Jewish worship. And so this isn't addressing the nation as Uh, a a national community, it's addressing a religious community, the spiritual leaders. And we know that the temple was divided into sections uh, for appropriateness. And so uh, only the priests could go into the holy place. And then there was a a court for uh, the Jewish men. And then there was a courtyard uh, for women. Uh, That was an important distinction for them. And then beyond that, there was this courtyard of the Gentiles. Interesting how God had designed in this plan an inclusion of the Gentiles, and it was recognized in the laying out of this from the very beginning, even though at this point in time, that place of the Gentiles was filled with all kinds of market going on. Now, that's not what was supposed to be happening at the temple. That was important when people came to the temple in that day and in that time and in the Jewish mindset of thinking, sacrifices were important. And so it was a place of bringing a sacrifice. So one can imagine that that had to be happening somewhere. And Jesus discovered that it was happening in the Gentile courtyard. Interesting. It seems to me that Jesus is calling these religious leaders back to their very roots, back to their very foundation. He's pointing back to the beginning of God's call for his people. He might, uh, he doesn't in this text, but I think he easily could uh, recite from Genesis 12, the blessing that God gave to Abraham and said, I'm going to bless you and make you great. And I'm going to make you a blessing to all the nations. You see, right from the beginning, God had a design and plan of inclusion, of bringing people together, of bringing them in, designed even in this courtyard system of the Temple Mount, of the Jewish worship system. But Jesus discovered that that's where buying and selling was going on. Of course, there were a number of things that he challenged here. It wasn't just challenging the sacrificial system, which... Uh, in a few days, he would demonstrate there was no more need for the sacrificial system. So maybe it, was, maybe it was a demonstration of clearing this place out, preparing it for something greater that God had in mind in his plan and design. But very practically, he was looking at some of the exchange that was going on there. And he was saying, didn't you know? And he points back, for instance, he goes back to a text in Isaiah And he pulls out of this broader text of a great vision in Isaiah 56 where the prophet speaking for God says that the house that God wants to create is to be called a house of prayer for all peoples. And Jesus points to this. He only quotes from verse 7, but very interestingly, he acts out verse (laughs) 8 because The prophet goes on to say, Thus says the Lord God in verse 8, Who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides his gathered ones. He's talking about those that are outside, those who are beyond the boundaries, those that aren't part of the Jewish community. He's gathering all the nations together. That's God's design and plan. This whole text in Isaiah 56 is just a very interesting one because 
He, I have some things pointed out there, I know you can't read them, but I just draw attention to it. He talks about in this section about the foreigners that he's drawing to himself and to the eunuchs who were separated from the center of worship. And uh, these folks, the foreigners and the eunuchs, they represent all these people who have been maligned, who've been put on the edges, who are on the margins of life. You know, the prophets had always been calling God's people to this. The judgment that the prophets make against the kings of Israel is because they aren't just people. They're not fair with people. And time and time again, you can read almost every one of the prophetic writers, and their call is, God is going to judge the Israelite kingdom because of the way that you treat the widowed, the orphan, and the alien. Time and time and time again. So it, it's, it's, not, it's not unusual that we would find a great vision like this text in Isaiah 56. So the prophet lays out the including of all of these people who had been separated. You see, in the barriers, in those walls on the temple courtyard for the Jewish people, for the Jewish women, and for the Gentiles, uh, that was for uh, people uh, who were whole. If you, uh, if you were blind, or if you were lame, if you were crippled, uh, if you were suffering from some disease, from an issue of blood that's described in a number of times, if, if you were, well, uh, you couldn't even get anywhere close if you were a leper, you, could, you couldn't even, you'd be cast out of the city, you wouldn't even get close to the temple area. See, so even beyond all the perfect in body uh, discriminating boundaries, there was this whole other group of people on the fringes. And God's plan is constantly calling for their inclusion to be brought in, to open the door to. So Jesus is really turning some things upside down. He sees this, and he sees it at the very center of the religious community. And they have found ways to insulate themselves. Why, that Gentile court... There isn't even room for Gentiles there because the buyers and sellers have all their tables there. There isn't really a place to pray because all this noise, the cacophony of, of sheep bleating and doves cooing and people shouting and buyers, buy this, buy here, buy here. No, no, buy from me. All this going on there, there isn't a place to pray. And Jesus sees the way that the religious community has established themselves, have insulated themselves. They have built their own walls around themselves to protect their system, enriching themselves. Just down the street would be the place of the Sanhedrin. I think of the, uh, the court system and, and you think of the Supreme Court. They were the people that had the power. They liked it this way because this fed their pockets. This controlled the place for themselves and kept people in their places. Did something need to be turned upside down? Oh, for sure it did. Jeremiah, in Jeremiah's writing, he talks about this, Jesus points to this in his text as well, but he says down in verse 8 of uh, Jeremiah chapter 7, he's talking about this religious community. Jesus applies it to his time and his place on the Jewish courtyard, court, but this has been happening for generations. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, make offerings to Baal, go after other gods that you have not known, and then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we're safe here. Only to go on doing all these abominations. Has this house, which is called by my name, Become a den of robbers in your sight? See how Jesus makes the application? He draws from Isaiah and he draws from Jeremiah and he points right in and he says, look at what's going on here. You have all this system. You've built up all these walls of protection to think that you're secure and you walk into this place and you have it all for yourself and you say, this is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. This is the house of the Lord. We're safe here. We're gonna, we're gonna do it. We're gonna be here and God is gonna protect us. It doesn't matter doesn't matter outside, what they do outside these walls. God's going to protect us because we've got, it. we've got the walls built safely and secure. But it's a den of robbery, of not recognizing God's priority and place. 
It's protecting ourselves. And it's need, there's a need for it to be turned upside down. And Jesus gets to that. I just love PJ singing this song for us. How deep the Father's love. That he'd give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. I will not boast in anything. No gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I'll boast in Jesus Christ. Jesus is calling us to make him our security. Forget about the distinguishing boundary lines that we want to create. The barriers, the walls for our protection. His wounds have paid my ransom. Jesus went straight to the Temple Mount. Went right to the heart of things. And he threw everyone who had set up shop, buying and selling, kicked out the tables of loan sharks, the stalls of the dove merchants. My house was designated a house of prayer. You've made it a hangout for thieves. So how? How do we turn things upside down? How do we follow in the footsteps of Jesus? How do we recognize those places where we have become comfortable and it needs to be turned upside down? How do we create an atmosphere where the people on the fringes, on the margins, feel included? You see, the blind and the lame found a place. The children sang at the Temple Mount. It was disturbing for those who were in leadership. But Jesus engaged even them. As the book of Matthew and the other gospel writers tell us in parables and stories that whole week, uh, 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 well, at least the day or two following Palm Sunday, leading up into the events of Holy Week until his stories, his challenges, bugged them so much that they arrested him because they wanted to kill him. How do we illustrate this kind of welcome? How do we demonstrate that we are a house of prayer? A house of prayer for all nations. For all nations. How do we demonstrate this kind of respect for life? How do we demonstrate a pro-life attitude at all stages of life and all ages? How do we demonstrate our care efforts in a way that would be upside down? I I recognize, you heard me from the beginning, there's a tension here. We we can't live constantly in upside-downness, but once we have been turned upside down, we move forward, and then we grow comfortable. The, the religious community of Jesus' day had demonstrated again how comfortable they had grown in protecting themselves, building their walls of security, uh, controlling the business atmosphere, padding their own pockets, excluding certain peoples. Hmm. How can we demonstrate our willingness to give up our comfort, move beyond that, to offer our help for others. I was reminded of this just a couple days ago. You know that uh, last week I was interviewed by the newspaper and an article on the front page appeared and then I got contacted and said, I disagree with you. Great, let's talk about it. I think we should help our own first. What do you mean by that? Well, we have people in our own community that are needy. We should help them first. Help all of those people, and if, if we, no, I don't even think we should ever help immigrants. I disagree with you there. We shouldn't have people come into our country. We have so many people, we need to help ourselves. I said, well, I don't disagree with you that we shouldn't help people. I don't think it's a either or. It's a both and. And fortunately, just that day, at our office, helping people with gas and food, We work with people to people. I told this person we're helping people in our community. As a matter of fact, our church 
very engaged with Habitat for Humanity. We one time even built a house right on our parking lot and that went to a family in our community. It's a both and, and obviously that's an upside down way of thinking, isn't it? <laughs> See, we want to protect, hold on to like the religious community. But how do we demonstrate our challenge to bigotry and racism and discrimination so that the world in which we live is turned upside down and people see the great love of God in Jesus Christ? It's a huge challenge for us. On this first day of Passion Week, on this day when we recognize the glad hosannas of the crowd, the children, the praises that Jesus received, let's also recognize the great challenge that God's kingdom is not one that we can build the security in, but can only trust in his great love and security that he offers us. Let's pray. As our hearts join with those who sing loud hosannas, as our arms wave the branches of the palm trees, as we recognize our willingness to honor Jesus, the Savior, God, Help us to recognize him as Jesus, as Lord of our lives. And allow him to turn us completely upside down. We trust you, God. May it be so even this week, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.